So why don't we talk a minute about the few writing challenges sure, and, sure. and solutions? One of the things I very often hear from younger parents, you know, ones in their late 20s or, or early 30s, they have now a school-aged child or a couple, and, and they realize so much that they did not learn. Um, and I, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of times, I, I never learned to write. I, I somehow got by through college, but I have no idea how to teach this. Uh, so that's one thing, is just the, the decline in the teaching of writing in American schools actually began around 1970. Uh, and it's very traceable. There has been a steady decline in the writing of high school graduates for 50 years. So clearly, whatever the schools have been doing um, did not work and is working even less now because so many kids don't read either. Right? I mean, most mm -hmm. kids, given a choice between a screen-based entertainment or recreational reading, well, you know what they choose. So the whole level of literacy is just in decline uh, everywhere, partly because of screen-based technology and the entertainment value that that has. And I'm not an anti-tech person, but I do know even at home school conventions 20 years ago, you'd see a bunch of kids and they all had their nose in a book. Now you go around and they've mm -hmm. all got a pad or a tablet or a phone. Even the two-year-olds in the stroller have got their finger on the, the thing. And I, you know, I think, so that's another problem, is this there's an overall decline of literacy and it's affecting even people who you know, want to teach their kids mm -hmm. at home. So they come against, I don't have a method or system, I don't remember how I learned this. And then uh, the third thing that's um, a challenge is of course um, finding the balance, if you will, between the progressive idea of teaching writing, which is writing is about self-expression. And that's why you teach children to write. It's, it's an artistic pursuit. It's something, you know, if you just give children paper and opportunity, they will learn this and in the process, you know, discover who they really are. You know, <laughs> this is the modern progressive view that's been dominant in the schools. On the other extreme uh, is you have to learn so much grammar that you can fill out every worksheet of every workbook you get for six years. Now can I ask on the, on the progressive view, it, has it come with that, the idea of then there's not a correct, I mean has it gone that far to where, and, and however they express themselves must be accepted as. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, that is precisely where the edge of progressive thinking is right now. Okay. And it's even more political, in, and there are some people working in the, that world of both education and linguistics who will make the argument that teaching grammar at all is inherently racist. <laughs> um, <laughs> however, if we look at the broad span of many thousands of years of world history, um, you can see a very clear relationship between attentiveness to precision in communication which grammar enables, and the rise of civilization, and then a falling away from attentiveness mm -hmm. to precision mm -hmm. in communication, and the decline of civilization. You know, we think of you need grammar to write well. Truth is, there are a whole lot of people who write very well and have very little knowledge of grammar. They have what you might call inherent grammar mm -hmm. because they were read to sure. as children, they read a lot, they, they have been in a, a rich language environment. Um, so for them, they're just the natural writer. In fact, it, um, being read to out loud is the number one predictor of good writing skills in adults. If I meet an adult who says, you know, I write pretty well, I guess, I think. I mean, I always got A's on my papers, but I don't remember learning to learning. do it. <laughs> I will ask, did one or both of your parents read to you a lot when you were growing up? And I'll tell you, eight times out of 10, they'll sit there and go, yeah, you know, actually, my father read the Reader's Digest every day at dinner, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the couple times where they'll say, no, my parents didn't read, but I was the oldest in the family and I read to my siblings. Because 
uh, one of the things I've discovered is that when children read silently, there's basically two kinds of kids and not many in the middle. Ones who love to read and ones who don't, right? And the ones who love to read, they read all the time, but they, they read books like they watch movies, which means they're reading fast. Mm -hmm. And the books are written to be read yeah. fast, page turner, page turner, yep. end of the book. Oh, I gotta read the next one in the series, mm -hmm. right? And it's all commercially driven. Um, which is fine. I mean, it helps them practice their decoding skills or whatnot. Um, but but at a certain point, they start reading faster than they could hear what they're reading. And then they do what you or I would do, which is skip words, mm -hmm. skip things, skip thing, skip a word you don't know. You don't need to know it to get the story. Right. Um, see a whole chunk of a sentence or a paragraph that doesn't look interesting or necessary to the plot. Skip it. Whereas, when we take in language through the ear, mm -hmm. we get every word, and if it's something that's well written and well read, we get um, a more elegant, more sophisticated, mm -hmm. complete syntax, and the audio input gives us clues and nuances about the grammar that's contained mm -hmm. in the language. Uh, you know, it's funny, you could say four words in four different ways, and it would mean four different things. I love reading out loud for that mm -hmm. reason. And I don't always do it, but sometimes when it's either something I need to understand better or when it's beautiful, there, you know, there's a thing happening here yeah. and you want to experience it all so, the way. Uh, um, I've been told that, that, that especially when homeschooling gets hard, things go mm. bad, it is, you're overwhelmed, whatever, just keep reading. Just keep reading. Just if, keep reading out loud Yep. If, because if. it's a simple... <laughs> powerful, effective thing to yeah. do. And you know, you think about um, history. A, a lot of us spent a lot of time looking at pages in textbooks of history, and what percentage of that did we retain? Yeah. Most of the history, for, in my kids, I'm 90% sure they would all say, I learned most of my history from historical fiction. Mm. And a lot of that, mom or dad would reading out loud to the whole mm -hmm. family. Well, why? You know, you could study a textbook that contains facts about the American Revolutionary Period, War for Independence, but when you read Johnny Tremaine, that story locks all those images and names and places and times, it locks it into your memory. So the other part of this, though, that I, I do like to mention, in terms of building fluency with reliably correct and sophisticated English vocabulary and syntax is memorization. This is something that has really been just thrown out of public mm -hmm. modern progressive education. Uh, it's Deweyism taken to an extreme. Dewey's idea about rote learning was that at best it's a waste of time and at worst it stifles creativity. So don't make children memorize. Education needs to be all about discovery and experience and, and insight. And, and there's a lot of truth to that, but you can't go to the opposite extreme and say memorizing is a waste of time because one thing we know, young children are wired for memorization. If you don't give them good and beautiful things to memorize, like poetry and scripture, they'll memorize the garbage they hear on the radio yeah. or the TV. Um, the second thing is that we know that all throughout all of history, memorized language has been the foundation for rhetorical training. So, you know, even in the ancient school, if you wanted to study rhetoric, the first thing you would do is memorize huge chunks of the best stuff that other people said mm -hmm. and wrote before that. Uh, the third thing that I have personally seen is that when children memorize even short kind of amusing super child friendly poems that pattern becomes now a tool that they can use when they want to say or write something a uh, good example uh, there's a poem called the ingenious little old man and it's a funny little poem and uh, it's short and a seven-year-old could memorize this. Uh, so there's this one little boy, he'd memorize this poem, and then next time he wrote a story, 
he used the word ingenious, which, w you know, is not on the normal vocabulary expectation for a seven-year-old. I mean, some homeschooling seven-year-olds. Um, but, but why was that word accessible to him? Because he had embedded it in his active memory, mm -hmm. his active vocabulary. If you, um, if you go way back into the 1700s, even before, and certainly up until the late 1800s, children were expected to memorize huge chunks of scripture and poetry mm -hmm. and famous speeches. In fact, one of my most favorite examples of the power of this is Frederick Douglass. So you know Frederick Douglass, born into slavery, separated from his parents at a young age, uh, forced to do hard labor. It was illegal to teach uh, an enslaved person to to do, read or no, do anything. Um, I, I think you would agree that next to being locked in a closet, it was possibly the worst possible educational environment that anyone could experience. Until he was 12 years old, at which point um, someone tried to start teaching him to read. However, 10 years after that, he, he was becoming, and I would argue did become, the greatest orator this country has ever produced. Really? You might argue that, okay, Patrick Henry was, you know, a notch above. That's arguable. But certainly from his time forward, mm. I mean, if you read his speech, which is usually entitled, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? Mm -hmm. It will blow your mind. And the fluid use of um, scripture, the fluid use of of the great ideas, the magnificent structuring of his sentences and the flow of language and the, the schemes and tropes of rhetoric. It, so it, it kind of raises the question, how did this person yeah. <laughs> with such horrible <laughs> education become the greatest orator mm -hmm. that we know of? So someone asked him, Mr. Douglas, how did you become such a powerful speaker? And he said, well, as a free man, one of the first books I owned was the Columbian Orator. Now, this is a small book. You can you can actually still buy it today. It was published in, if I recall, 1794, I think. So post-revolution, but late period. And it was a collection of, of many of the most famous speeches that had ever been mm. given, all the way back to Cicero, and um, Augustine and Luther and some Shakespeare and Patrick Henry was in there, I think. And he said, you know, I committed them all to memory. <laughs> I mean, he basically memorized a book of speeches. But what did that do? It stocked, yeah. it's, it furnished his mind, mm. I think is the correct expression. It furnished his mind with not just the vocabulary, not just the grammatical structures, not just the, the beauty of language with the rhetorical devices that liven it, but with the very fabric of ideas of truth mm -hmm. and justice and right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just fear that we, we, as a culture, we've completely lost any discipline. Uh, it's really only Christians and to some degree Orthodox Jews, practicing Orthodox Jews, who have much of a tradition of memorizing anything. Mm. Is there anything else you'd like to share about writing or excellence in writing here before we shift from Yeah, that? I think briefly, um, you had asked me why is writing hard and I got a little distracted on because nobody who came out of school really learned how to teach it and the modern progressive idea. But if we break it down and look at it very objectively. What is writing? Well, first, in order to write anything, there must be an idea. Fair enough? If there is no idea, nothing can be written. So there must be a pre-existing idea. Now, this idea can exist inside your mind, such as a memory or an imagination. Or this idea can exist outside your mind. Information that you heard or saw or read, and by hearing, seeing, reading, it comes into your mind. 
So it will end up in your mind, but it can originate mm -hmm. either inside or outside. The second thing is that this idea must be spoken into existence. It can exist in words, for example, an Aesop fable that you just read, or it can exist in a less concrete form. If you, if I say, you know, write about your trip to Europe, you're now relying on your memory, which is a lot more on images, right, and maybe impression, sensory impression. If I say write about your dog, that's super hard, because for kids, there aren't words associated with dogs, there's feelings, there's this kind of visceral, kinesthetic, sensory love. A and getting an idea from that is much harder than getting an idea from an Aesop fable. But either way, if it pre-exists in words or whether it doesn't pre-exist in words, you have to speak it into existence. That's how it becomes something that is communicable. If you don't speak it into existence, there's no way that I can transfer the memory or image from my brain directly to yours. Spock, mind meld. No, we don't have it yet. We, we are limited, gifted, but limited by words. So then you speak it into existence. Now, as you speak this idea into existence, you have to hear what you just said to yourself. Have you ever noticed some people can speak and not hear what they said? <laughs> uh, there's two groups of people who do this, politicians and young children. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, but you have to hear, which means you need the listening skill, right? To hear what you said to yourself. This is why children talk to themselves all the time. It's a way in which they start to learn how to hear what they are thinking. Mm -hmm. And they speak ideas. Is that why my wife wants to talk about what she's trying to figure out? Absolutely. Then she knows what she's thinking about. Yeah. yeah. It just bounces around in there until... Mm -hmm. ah. It becomes concrete. And may I also ask, I think Mortimer Adler, as a teacher, said that if someone read something and he said, did you understand it? And they said yes. And he said, what did it say? Mm -hmm. And they cannot repeat it. They so then you don't understand, understand it. it. Exactly. Yeah. So, so then you speak this idea into existence. Now, when you're young, you may do that with your voice. As you get older, you can speak an internally audiate language, right? Um, but that's a, that's a developmental step. Okay. Now, once you have heard this idea, once you've heard what you said to yourself, you have to remember what you heard yourself say to yourself long enough to go find the first word and where it's how it's spelled. Right? So you think, okay, I'm gonna write this. This is the idea. Now I have to spell this word. If it's not automatic, then you have to kind of depart from the language area of your brain and go over to the spelling area of your oh, brain. Oh, you are still on just the word not spelled. Right. Now, you now you identified have identified the word. Right. Idea. Now you mm -hmm. have to remember or figure out how to spell this word. Right? And then you've got to go and remember the second word and remember, and remember how to write that one. And then you've got to go to the third word and you've got to hold this in your memory long enough that you can write the entire idea. Now, if there is a breakdown anywhere in that system, either finding an idea, speaking it into existence, hearing what you said, remembering what you've said, and then finding the information you need to write the word and holding that in your mind long enough if there's a breakdown anywhere in that what happens you got to start all over again this is the real number one reason why writing is so frustrating to kids they get overwhelmed with the complexity of that process in fact it's so complex i've been thinking about just the fact that human beings write should be proof of the existence of god it's just insanely complex well, everything about humans is insane. Everything about all creation is insanely complex. But as a teacher of writing, when you really look at it, wow, it's incredible we do this. Now, the more we do it, the easier it gets. And the quicker we access the, the spelling and writing information, and then we start to type, and things become very automatic and mechanical, and we can hold larger chunks of words in our memory 
um, and sequences of ideas in our memory all at once. So what we do at IEW, if you, if you wanted the elevator speech, you know, what makes your writing program different? The answer is we break the very complex process into small, manageable, doable steps. And so children are much less likely to be overwhelmed. Because that is the number one reason that anyone would hate anything. They're overwhelmed with complexity too much. Uh, and so we have, uh, and you have experience with this. So you give them what to write, yeah, which so is we, one of the biggest We start steps. with an idea that is outside their memory or imagination, so it's, it's there, you can see it. It's already in words, right? And mm -hmm. we just teach them how to make a little keyword outline and then re-speak that right back into existence. And then the keyword outline is there to help them remember the sequencing of those ideas so they can say it, they hear it, they try to write it. If they forget how to spell a word, the outline is right handy. If they want to change something, they can change something. They're not locked to it. And you also don't even emphasize spelling as a thing to worry about in that process. Right, you? yeah. I always say, you know, just ask me how to spell it and I'll tell you. Right. And if I'm not available, give it your best guess and we'll fix it up later. Yeah, I'm not, not into this inventive spelling. But right, right. what I but am it's saying not is the point of that moment, exactly. which is learning to write. Yes. I mean, the structure of the sentence. Yeah. And then through our nine units, we start with this kind of dictated content. And it's really, I, I have, I, I won't say never, but I have no memory of meeting a child of any age who could not get going in this process. I definitely have met kids 10, 12 years old who never wrote a sentence on their own, who by the end of just one class of using keyword outlines was doing this. So you see, in some cases, it, it looks almost miraculous, but no, it's you're removing the complexity, mm -hmm. and this is why it works so well with you know, your dyslexic, dysgraphic, even your you know, ADD kinds of kids. It's, it's breaking this huge complex thing into small manageable parts. And then through our nine units, we move from the dictated content with the keyword outline to retelling stories where you have less information uh, to summarizing where you don't use every sentence or every fact, you just choose the interesting, important, and relevant ones. Then w when we get to Unit 5, writing from pictures, now we're in the world of ideas that did not pre-exist in words. They're having to describe the events in pictures. So that's a, that's a key moment there because they have to be able to look at a picture ask questions about that picture, hear the answers that they can have to the questions they ask themselves about the picture, and get that into a keyword outline, mm -hmm. and then write it up. So that's a, a kind of a key point in our process. Unit six is research, which is, uh, of course, a valuable skill for everyone. That's when you have too many sources with too many facts. And how do you sort through all those and create a fused outline? Uh, unit seven is what we call inventive. Some people call creative writing. This is where there's no pictures, there's no story. It's just you, your brain, and whatever you happen to carry around in it. But by then, they've got this habit of being able to ask questions, hear answers, speak those into existence, record them in outline form, and then the writing is so much more easy. So what would you say for students who have enough in their mind that they're itching to get out, that they're yeah. really frustrated with the process of, yes. you keep telling me what to say, can I not just write something? Well, yeah, there's two things to say about that. One is, um, a lot of times kids are frustrated because they think so much faster than they can write. So they can think of the story and talk it to you and just go on and on and on. And you say, great, write it down. They're dead in the water because <laughs> they can't slow down their brain. Um, this is more typical of boys who are really imaginative and they, 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 they can just go wild with content, but when you say write it down, they can't, they can't slow mm -hmm. that down. So this is training them to break that into pieces. The other thing, you know, a lot of people ask, well, you know, use these models and checklists. It seems kind of formulaic. Doesn't that stifle creativity? And I point out, well, writing is an art like art, uh, drawing, painting. Uh, it's like music. It's like sports. You have to do certain things mm -hmm. in a very structured way in order to gain the basic skills to be creative in that sport. So, you know, if we taught music, 
the way we've taught writing in this country for the last 50 years. It would kind of go like this. <laughs> yeah, come on in. I'll teach you how to play the piano. You know, I'll teach you all the names of the notes. And there's these pedals. You can experiment with that. And just kind of what you need to do is just explore the piano. Just go home and fool around for 20, 30 minutes a day for the next five years. And you'll <laughs> learn to play the piano. Well, I mean, it's, it's true you would learn something. But what do we do? What do we know works better? Play this piece. Play it in this way imitate me precisely, build up a repertoire. And now, after doing that for several years, now let's talk about things like the creative elements, interpretation, improvisation, composition. But creativity never exists unless quality creativity does not exist without a foundation of basic skills. And that's true whether you learn to paint or draw buildings or do gymnastics or write stories or poems mm -hmm. or essays. So that that would be my, you know, my trying to reach out to that child and say, I know you want to do whatever you want to do, but I also know some things that if you will conform and practice this, it will make you even better. My goal isn't to produce good writing. My goal is to nurture better writers, and I know how to do that. What are we trying to cultivate in this family? And, and that's a conversation mom and dad have to have. Mm. And then you can filter everything through that objective. Um, you, you decide, do you want this picture on the wall or not? Well, is having this picture in our corporate culture going to help grow those things which we're trying to grow. Love of God, love of neighbor, compassion, selflessness, um, purity, you know, name your, make your list. Make your list. And then you can say, okay, is this music that we're bringing in, is that going to help grow what we want to grow? This curriculum that we are looking at, is this going to grow what we're going to grow? Um, is this activity? You know, debate, musical theater, you know, is that going to help grow what we're trying to grow? And if the answer is yes, well then, your decision becomes much easier. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then it's just a financial one, right? If the answer is no, it, it actually probably won't. Well then, your decision is even easier and doesn't involve any finances. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where dad, you know, kind of the executive of the family, the buck stops with dad. And mom has to do everything to make it all work. But the direction and the decisions upon which her decisions are based, I think in a properly ordered family, uh, that's what God gave to fathers. Um, but it's hard. And in some cases, you know, dads are checked out and moms have to do both jobs. Um, in some cases, dads get really authoritarian and want to micromanage everybody. And that often ends up with kids just, you know, Rejecting running away as soon thing. as they yeah. can and then hating, hating the faith, you yeah. know. So, you know, it's, 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 it's always about you. Homeschooling is always about yourself, not about your kids. And if you're in good condition, right, and if you have on the you know, the armor and take up the shield and wield the sword uh, of the spirit, you can fight off, so to speak, um, those um, forces that would like to harm or even destroy your family. Um, so your spiritual condition, that's tops. There's nothing more important in a family mm. than the spiritual condition of the parents with the dad being first, I would say. There's always gonna be things that threaten our faith, that threaten our commitment, that, that cause us to wonder or doubt. So it, we have to live conversion. And that means, well, as you're doing, committing scripture to memory, write it on your heart and you've got it. Um, and, and, and then, you know, in that example, um, your children see that and that's that's infinitely more 
valuable than mm -hmm. any talking mm -hmm. you could do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's actually, I'm not a fan of country western music in general, but there is a particularly good song and one of the verses, the whole song is about, I saw my daddy do it, right? Mm -hmm. And there's one verse where he sees his father on his knees mm. in prayer and how that, that was the thing that really made him realize his dad was real, that it wasn't just an act. Or whatever. One last thought then is this pandemic and its effect on home education, which it clearly is with many more joining and at the same time taking out our conferences and all, and all of this kind of thing. Uh, have, we're not very far into it, but what thoughts have you developed as far as what's happening and where this is going as far as home education and what we can do as leaders yeah. to respond effectively. Well, obviously there's more people flooding into home education than right. anyone would have imagined. Um, a, a lot of things are coming to light that were not. Um, parents looking at what their kids are doing on the computer for their distance learning really is the first time they're seeing what the school is. Because they can't walk into a school and just hang mm -hmm. out in the classroom and read the books or listen. There, it's it's impossible. So they're actually now. S is this even? Is this curriculum even good? Mm -hmm. uh, and and so there's a lot of questioning there. Um, people say, well, I guess it's better to homeschool. I'll try it for a year. But what happens then? Community. And I think far more people join homeschooling trying it for a year and stick in for a long time then try for a year and go back. We also have um, uh, mechanisms to support, you know, online classes here and there and video and, you know, CC groups and other co-ops and charters, even hybrid charter schools are, are booming uh, in some states. Um, I mean, they're not legally homeschooling, but basically they're at home learning the curriculum of mom's choice, mom and dad's choice. So, but even on a broader scale, I have noticed just kids on the streets in our neighborhood, families taking walks. Um, there seems to be just the, one of the effects of the lockdown period was, well, now you get to be home with your family, like it or not. And I think for many, that was a freedom. That was almost a renewal, mm -hmm. an opportunity to renew relationships. And I've read so many articles of, you know, parents saying, my kid is totally different. He's mm -hmm. not stressed anymore. He's not, you know, afraid of the bullies. You know, we, we, re we sat on the couch and read books and laughed. We haven't done that forever, you know. So I think that even on the outside of the homeschooling, there's been some benefit. And there's also been some horrible, you know, horrible things, people just flipping out completely. And there's, there's always going to be that. Um, but like anything, um, w we lead by example. We say, this is, this is how we homeschool. And if we can help you, let's do that.